Hi, I'm Brennan Moncrief with McLaren and Associates. And tonight I'll be discussing everything involving DSO transactions. So unpacking DSO transactions, we're going to talk about private equity. We're going to talk about current market conditions. We'll talk about DSO deal structures, DSO myths, as well as how to go about maximizing your outcome in a DSO transaction. So with that, I'll hop right in. A little bit about me and my company. So my name is Brandon Moncrief again. I'm the principal and CEO of McLaren and Associates. I have 22 years of experience in the dental industry. I spent the first nine years of my career as a dental lender, lending money to dentists all across the country to buy practices. And in that realm, I was involved in about 1500 practice transitions, primarily from a doctor to doctor perspective. 12 years ago, I decided I wanted to leave lending and I purchased McLaren and Associates. McLaren has been around for over 35 years. Uh, it was initially started in Texas by a former dentist, Paul McLaren. He owned the company for about 23 years before I purchased it again, 12 years ago. So for the first seven, eight years of ownership, we really focused on doctor to doctor transactions in Texas. And then about five years ago, as we saw the industry begin to consolidate rapidly and doctors begin to look at partnering with DSOs and selling to private equity, we evolved and built out a team and a process to provide sell-side advisory for dentists nationwide who are considering going down the DSO path. I couldn't do what I do without our awesome team. This is a group picture here. Um, my brother and business partner is a former Patterson rep. We have a guy with an MBA from Wharton, a law degree from Penn, former investment banker. We've got a CPA on the team. We have a former dentist on the team and a lot of former bankers. So fantastic team that serves our clients on a daily basis. A little bit about us. As I mentioned, we've been established for 35 years, one of the most established practice brokers and sell side advisors in the dental industry. We've been involved in over a thousand successful practice sales, closed over 1.2 billion in transaction volume, and we truly specialize in providing sell side advisory for DSO transactions. So for large practice owners who are contemplating affiliating with the DSO are bringing on a private equity partner. We're based in Austin, but we serve clients nationwide and we actually have employees in each time zone. So we have an office in San Diego, an office in Atlanta, and an office in Austin, as well as several people spread out in between. So let's hop right in, talk a little bit about DSO private equity terminology. I'm gonna throw out a lot of terms as we go through this webinar. So I wanna make sure that you're familiar with uh, all the, the lingo that we use in this world. Uh, private equity. What is private equity? Uh, essentially, private equity is when wealthy individuals invest money with business people that acquire and build companies. So private equity is just privately held companies that are typically funded through a combination of equity from high net worth individuals and leverage from banks, essentially bank debt. Uh, EBITDA. This is, you know, everybody's talking about EBITDA now. In the dental world, it used to be net cash flow, but today we talk a lot about EBITDA because that's a accounting private equity term. And it's really what drives value from a private equity perspective when they're looking at practices to acquire. So EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Another way to think about it is absentee owner profit. How much profit does, does, the business, does the business generate after all the overhead expenses are paid, including a market wage for the doctor to produce the dentistry? So think of that as absentee owner profit, the profit that's going to be available to the DSO, to the private equity investor once all the bills are paid. Recapitalization event. Essentially what that means is that that's a liquidity event when the DSO, the private equity firm, sells the business to the next investor. 
So typically the goal of private equity is to invest in a DSO, build it, grow it, and then sell it to the next investor, typically a larger investor within a three to five year window. And at that recapitalization event, that private equity firm typically has the ability to sell most or all of their interest in that company. And then the DSO's management team, as well as the doctors that own equity in the DSO have the opportunity to liquidate all or a portion of their equity. So the goal is to get to a recapitalization event and to generate a substantial return for investors. That return, the difference between what you invest and the net profits you generate at a recapitalization event is referred to as arbitrage. Arbitrage is essentially the gain that's generated through private equity investing and building a DSO. Equity versus leverage. Equity is investor money and rollover equity that the doctors invest in the DSO. So think of that as cash invested in the business. Leverage is debt. So that is bank funded investment. Equity and leverage are, are, are very different. The arbitrage that occurs, the gain occurs on the equity that's invested in the business. Joint venture. This, is, this basically describes uh, a type of DSO deal structure whereby the equity component, so let's say you sell 60 or 70% of your practice and you retain 30 to 40% ownership in the business, that retained equity within your own four walls is referred to as joint venture equity. So the joint venture deal structure is a really common deal structure in the DSO space today. And when we get into unpacking DSO deal structures, we'll dive a little bit more into what joint venture equity means and how it functions. Conversely, holding company equity or stock means equity at the DSO level, at the parent company level. So uh, think of that as investing in the broader DSO as opposed to joint venture equity, retaining equity within your own four walls. The private equity playbook. So a lot of people are curious, you know, how does private equity make money? Uh, one, you know, how do they invest in dental practices? How do they build a DSO? And how do they generate arbitrage? How do they generate a return? So here I'll go through it in the form of text. And then the next slide, I'll go through it and talk a little bit about the numbers and show you an example of how this plays out numerically. So the private equity playbook in the dental industry typically involves raising a fund. So pooling money from investors, typically in the range 20, 30, $40 million that they raise before they go to market and look to acquire a platform. So what's a platform? A platform is typically a multi-site practice in a good geography with EBITDA of anywhere from two to 5 million where the founder or founders of the business want to stay on post-close and play a major role in helping grow the DSO post-closing. So once the private equity raises a fund and they acquire their platform, from there, they're typically going to acquire additional platforms or use the, the wheel and spoke approach. The platform is the wheel and the spokes are additional acquisitions. They'll start to build out additional density within the geography where the platform was located. So they may, let's, for discussion purposes, buy a multi-site practice in Atlanta with EBITDA of 3 million. Once that transaction closes, once the platform is established, they'll begin to start practices and or acquire practices in the Atlanta market. And they may then move to Tampa and, and buy a platform in Tampa or establish a platform in Tampa and then build out in that geography. That's a very, very common approach that private equity takes in the DSO marketplace. Once they get to five to 10 offices, they're going to start to build substantial infrastructure. Now, sometimes the platform they acquire will come along with some centralized infrastructure. And that's typically in the form of accounting, bookkeeping, compliance, legal, HR, and then adding on 
revenue cycle management, marketing, recruiting, all the functions that a large scalable DSO needs in order to operate and continue to grow. DSOs are going to leverage economies of scale to increase revenue and decrease overhead. So because of their size, they're able to leverage the payers, the PPOs, for better reimbursement rates than a private practice can. And they're able to leverage vendors, dental supply companies, equipment companies, labs, uh, health insurance, benefit plans, 401ks. Because of their size, they're able to acquire those services for a much lower cost than a single practice or a small group of practices can. So through leveraging economies of scale to increase revenue and decrease overhead, in turn, they typically increase top line revenue as well as EBITDA. And after you go through the cycle of acquiring a platform, building out infrastructure, acquiring and starting additional offices, once you get to substantial size, EBITDA of 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars, typically you're going to look to recapitalize. You're going to look to sell the investment, sell the DSO to the next investor. And when that occurs, typically nothing changes except for the investor behind the veil. And then that when that investor comes in, acquires that business, they're going to repeat the cycle. They're going to continue to grow typically at an even faster clip and acquire and start additional practices, build out additional infrastructure, and continue to leverage those economies of scale to drive up revenue and EBITDA. So that's the private equity playbook in the Dell industry. And you've got 200, 300 DSOs currently operating under this playbook. So let's talk about what that looks like from a numerical perspective, all right? So we talked about it raising initial fund. In this example, let's say the private equity firm or family office raises an initial fund of $30 million. And they're going to acquire a platform with it of $2.5 million for $25 million. So they're going to pay, some would say overpay, 10 times EBITDA for their initial platform investment. And platforms will typically trade for a premium as opposed to bolt-on practices. Now, once they've acquired the platform, they're going to continue to acquire offices. And let's say that they acquire an additional $35 million in EBITDA at a cost average of seven times EBITDA. So they invest another $245 million in the platform. So the initial acquisition was $25 million. They've now spent $245 million to acquire additional offices. So the total investment is $270 million. We're going to assume that 60 million of that total investment is equity. 30 million to 40 million in cash, and then another 20 to 30 million in rollover equity. So as they've acquired practices, their deal structure has mandated that their doctor partners, the sellers, roll a portion of the value of their practice into equity in the DSO. So let's assume that the total equity invested between cash and rollover equity from the doctors that joined the DSO is 60 million. And the other 210 million of the $270 million investment is leverage. It's bank debt. All right. So at recap, they sell for 12 times EBITDA. The EBITDA is 37.5 million. So 12 times 37.5 million. They sell for $450 million, all right? That's the total sales price of the DSO at recap. One private equity firm selling to the next private equity firm. So let's look at the net. We've got $450 million purchase price minus the debt of $210 million equals a $240 million net on $60 million equity investment in, let's say, five years. That's a 400% return on investment in a five-year window. An incredible return. And this is a very you know middle of the fairway example. These types of returns are being generated in the dental industry quite frequently. So you can understand why when we look at it from a mathematical return standpoint, 
why private equity absolutely loves the dental industry and why so much private equity funding has been flowing into this industry over the past five to 10 years. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's, let's talk about dental industry consolidation at large. Uh, private equity has a huge amount of dry powder. Um, why is that? I mean, capitalism is set up so that the rich get richer and wealthy individuals need a diversified portfolio as the stock market has continued to go bonkers over the past decade. Most portfolio managers want to have a balance of equities, stocks, fixed income, bonds, as well as alternative investments. And that's high risk, high reward. And that's where private equity comes into play. So as the stock market has continued to ratchet up, money managers have had to consistently rebalance portfolios and push more and more money into private equity. So as high net worth individuals look for places to put money that has strong returns, private equity is the place to go. It has been the place to go for the past 20 years. Private equity loves stable, highly profitable, and fragmented industries. And dental fits that perfectly. Over the past decade, private equity has had access to really, really inexpensive bank debt. Yes, debt's gotten more expensive recently, but you saw the returns on the previous slide. Even if interest rates go to 7, 9, 10%, when you're generating a 400% return over a five-year window, it's not that painful. Um, so we've had private equity to a huge amount of cash, inexpensive bank debt. The dental industry is very stable, highly profitable, very fragmented industry. And that means that it can benefit from organizing a DSO and leveraging economies of scale. Um, it's highly profitable and very stable. It's proven that it's recession proof and pandemic proof. So for those reasons, private equity loves dental. So why have dentists over the past five years chosen more and more to go down the private equity, down the DSO path? When I would say pri previous to to about five, seven years ago, DSO was really a four-letter word in our industry. Corporate dentistry had a very negative moniker, and it still does to some of you, but it's become much more widely acceptable. Why is that? And I believe that is because DSOs have learned to stay in their lane. DSOs have learned to partner with doctors and support them from a business and administrative perspective and stay away from trying to control their clinical autonomy. So because private equity has learned to stay in their lanes, because they've learned to partner with dentists and share in the financial arbitrage that PE and their investors enjoy through investing in this industry, DSOs have become a legitimate transition option. They become a lot more attractive for large practice owners that are looking to de-risk, take some chips off the table at a great valuation and get some help from an administrative perspective, but not completely give up their clinical and operational autonomy. So from a valuation perspective, private equity has made the DSO conversation pretty compelling. When a practice crosses about 1.5 million in revenue, about 300,000 in EBITDA, the value of that practice in the private equity world starts to very quickly run away from practice valuations in the private buyer world. So from a doctor to doctor perspective, you know, a practice with revenue of, let's say, $2 million a year, that practice is typically going to trade for, let's say, 75% of revenue. 1.5 million, maybe on a good day, if you can find a buyer that's got the chops to buy a practice of that size, that same practice, 2 million in revenue, let's call it 500,000 in EBITDA in the DSO world could trade for as high as three to three and a half million dollars. So easily twice what a private buyer would pay for it. For that reason alone, the, the economic delta between the private buyer marketplace and the DSO private equity marketplace, it's been a pretty compelling argument for doctors with large practices 
to look to sell to a DSO rather than sell to a private buyer. Dentistry has also gone through a significant amount of change. You know, I've been in dentistry now over 20 years, and I would say it's changed more in the past 10 years than it did in the previous 50 years. And a lot of that change is surrounding the fact that you've got to be more dynamic uh, from a business perspective in order to be successful as a practice owner. So the kids coming out of dental school today over the past 10 years have had significantly more student loan debt and have entered a much more crowded marketplace. It's much more competitive. There's more practices. There's PPO infiltration, you know, driving down reimbursement rates. As we all know, overhead only goes up over time. So it's starting to squeeze margins. And right now the labor market's an absolute mess. Um, so you've got to be much more dynamic from a business perspective to be successful in ownership. And many of our clients who have built very successful, large multi-million dollar revenue practices employ large staffs and deal with a lot of headaches. And a lot of them feel burned out, you know, whether it's from a clinical perspective or from a management perspective. And because private equity and DSOs have learned how to support doctors from an administrative perspective, it's made a lot of younger doctors, you know, in their late 30s to late 40s, look at monetizing the value of their business, take some chips off the table and get some help from an administrative perspective. So we're seeing that the age of our clients is, is definitely declining. And most of our DSO clients are not using a DSO affiliation as a means for retirement planning, although that's an option. They're using it as a means to generate generational wealth, to put away a nest egg, to invest alongside private equity in the DSO and participate in future recap events, and then to get help from a business perspective, help from an administrative perspective, help lift that burden so that they have a little bit better quality of life. And typically so that they can spend more time with their family and that so they're not as stressed out and, and they can also get out of debt. So let's talk about current market conditions. Practice valuations have increased substantially post COVID. So we saw a lot of private equity interest, a lot of DSOs come to fruition pre COVID. You know, I would say we had somewhere around 150 to 200 DSOs uh, that existed pre COVID. Now we have over 300 DSOs nationwide. Once dentistry proved once again to be recession proof, pandemic proof, private equity was already interested in our industry. Once they saw how dentistry rebounded coming out of COVID, they were even more interested. So we had buyers, DSOs that were already in the marketplace pre-COVID double down and begin to, to buy even faster and pay higher valuations. And then we saw new DSOs be formed and new private equity enter the marketplace. And as a result, demand increased and valuations increased substantially. Practices that were trading for you know five times EBITDA pre-COVID are now trading for six to seven times EBITDA. Practices that were trading for seven to eight times EBITDA pre-COVID are now trading for nine to 10 times EBITDA. So there's been about a 20 to 25% increase in valuations of large practices since COVID. Currently over 300 DSOs nationwide. I know that number is shocking to some people. Uh, the other day I was talking to a CPA who asked me for a list of DSOs that were buying practices in Florida. And he was floored to hear that there's over 50 DSOs buying practices in Florida alone. Um, we've recently entered a, a period of a bit of economic uncertainty, right? We've got rising interest rates. We've got recessionary fears. I mentioned this earlier. We're not really... We're not really concerned about how rising interest rates are going to impact private equity interest in the DSO space and, and the dental industry because the returns are still so robust. A small movement in interest rates isn't really going to keep them up at night. What we're more concerned about is access to capital for some DSOs, for some private equity investors. So because of the regional banking crisis, because a lot of banks are fearful that a recession is on the horizon. They've been more conservative regarding 
how much leverage they're willing to extend to private equity firms to build a DSO. So for example, a lot of DSOs were out there buying practices at let's say seven times EBITDA and their banks were lending them money at five to six times EBITDA. So between the doctor's equity rollover and the leverage they were able to get from their banks, they were able to acquire practices at seven times EBITDA without investing any of their own money. But banks have since started to pull back and they're lending money to private equity at four to five times EBITDA. Well, valuations haven't changed. So practices are still trading for seven times EBITDA. Banks are only lending at four to five times EBITDA when they were lending at six times EBITDA. So private equity is being asked to inject their own capital into these transactions in order to get them closed. Well, if private equity is not flush with cash, if they've already burned through their initial fund and they're not good at raising additional capital or there's not enough EBITDA being generated by the DSO to bridge the gap between what the banks will lend and where the practice is going to trade, the DSO cannot continue to grow unless they take on a new banking partner. They're hard to find at the moment or they recapitalize and take on a new private equity partner that has plenty of dry powder to deploy on acquisitions. So what you've seen is that some DSOs don't have enough capital to continue growing and they're looking for new banking partners. They're looking to recapitalize. Unfortunately though, it's not a great marketplace at the current time to be looking to recap. Now we're expecting the storm to clear and that to change over the next 12 to 18 months. So while some DSOs are on hold from a buying perspective now, they're likely going to hit a recapitalization event in the next 12 to 18 months and be able to begin buying practices again. The good news is that there's plenty of DSOs that are well run and that have plenty of capital. Uh, and there's plenty of younger DSOs that have recently taken on private equity that have plenty of dry powder and they have plenty of availability of leverage with their banks to continue to be aggressive from an acquisition perspective. But I'd be amiss to say that some DSOs don't have a lot of capital right now. And a lot of DSOs are being tested from an operational perspective. The investors on the back end at Recap are looking at, great, you've been good at aggregating practices, but how good are you at operating at scale? Are you making the practices that you buy better? Is there revenue and EBITDA increasing post-affiliation or moving backwards? So DSOs are being tested from an operational perspective. Same store sales growth is become a, a major talking point when the institutional investors are looking at whether or not they want to invest in or buy a particular DSO. As a result, DSOs are being more selective regarding the practices they acquire. So, I mean, practices that PPO fee for service in a good geography where the doctors got significant runway to retirement, multi-doctor practices, multi-million dollar revenue, EBITDA of 500,000 plus, those practices are still trading for all-time highs from a valuation perspective. You know, practices that have maybe significant Medicaid exposure, or the doctor only has two to three years uh, until retirement, um, or the financials are murky. Those practices are becoming harder and harder to move and are trading for lower multiples at the moment. So you've seen DSOs because they're under more scrutiny from their banks, they're more they're under more scrutiny from institutional investors that they're looking to sell to at recap. They're being a little bit more careful about the practices that they're bidding on. But when they bid, those high class class A assets are trading for premium multiples, all-time high valuations. So that's the good news. But there's definitely a, a demarcation of the DSO marketplace occurring kind of the haves and, and the, you know, the have nots as far as capital is concerned, as far as infrastructure and operational pedigree are concerned. So you need to be very careful if you're planning to take your practice to market about who you partner with. You know, do they have infrastructure? Do they have a strong operational pedigree? Does their private equity firm 
have a track record of producing strong returns in dental or at least in other healthcare verticals. Does their private equity partner have plenty of dry powder? Who is their banking partner? And are they actively lending? And if so, at what EBITDA multiple? So let's switch, switch gears. We talked a little bit about private equity, how they invest in the dental market. We talked about current market conditions. Let's talk about why doctors choose to sell to a DSO. And I'll make the point right now. Uh, we built our company on doctor to doctor transactions, and we still do a ton of doctor to doctor transactions. We got involved in the DSO private equity space because we knew that once private equity enters an industry, they don't go away. It typically picks up horsepower and they start to consolidate the industry faster and faster. So we knew that successful practice owners were going to choose to go down the private equity DSO path with or without us. We weren't necessarily an advocate of private equity or DSOs getting involved in our industry, but we knew that doctors needed to be educated and protected and create as much optionality as possible. We knew that a lot of doctors were going to choose to go down the DSO path, whether we liked it or not, whether it was in the best interest of the industry uh, or not. So we got educated, built out a process and built out a team to represent doctors who are looking at this option. So that said, we're an advocate for you. We're not necessarily an advocate for DSOs or private equity. We want to ensure that if you're going to go down that path, that you've got proper representation, that you maximize your outcome, that you're educated, that you explore your options and end up with a fantastic result. So why choose to sell to a DSO? We already talked about the fact that DSOs typically pay a much, much higher valuation for large practices than private buyers will pay. In fact, the reality is that, I mean, if you've got a practice with top line revenue of three, four, five million dollars plus, there's not really a private buyer out there that can buy a practice like that. The only way to transition a practice like that to a private buyer is going to be through selling typically a minority interest to multiple doctors, potentially associates in your practice. That's very complicated. It takes a long amount of time to pull off and you're gonna sell for a significantly lower valuation than a DSO or private equity buyer is going to pay. The exercise we went through earlier, that $2 million practice worth 1.5 million in the private buyer world versus three to three and a half million dollars in the DSO world, that's a massive delta. You know, one and a half to $2 million is a huge premium compared to what a private buyer would pay. So that reason alone, the economic implications has caused a lot of large practice owners to look at going down the DSO path rather than sell, you know, in the traditional manner to a private buyer. A lot of our clients want to de-risk. Uh, they built a very, very valuable business. They're maybe concerned about, you know, the economy. Uh, there's geo geopolitical concerns. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world today. And a lot of our doctors want to protect an, their nest egg, you know, take some chips off the table while valuations are high. Um, so a lot of them are choosing to go to market maybe a little sooner than they had planned to protect the equity in their business. Alleviate the management burden. We've talked about how the management burden from a, from a practice ownership perspective has increased exponentially over the past decade. So a lot of our doctors, you know, maybe they started a practice or bought a practice when they were in their late 20s to their mid 30s. Maybe they didn't have a family, family at the time where they had a young family and they built this very successful business and now the business is kind of running them rather than them running the business. You know, they're chained to it 24-7, constantly thinking about it, whether they're, you know, at the chair, away from the chair, at home, on vacation, it follows them wherever they go. So if they can affiliate with a DSO, get some help from a management perspective and de-risk and monetize some of the equity in their business, it's going to help them sleep a little bit better at, at night. 
and help improve their work-life balance. A lot of doctors have built successful businesses and they want to take them to the next level. So they want to continue to grow, whether that be acquire or start additional offices or simply take advantages of economies of scale the DSOs can offer to increase their top line revenue as well as increase their EBITDA. This is a big one, especially for doctors that maybe they are within five years of retirement. They want to sell their practice, but they're not ready to step away from the chair. And whether that may be you know, economically or from an emotional standpoint, when you affiliate with a DSO, they allow you to continue working in your office long-term post-closing. So that's attractive for a lot of doctors. Now, we don't want to overcommit you, right? Typically, you're looking at a three to five-year commitment post-closing in order to maximize practice value. But in reality, the DSO, they're not going to do dentistry in your practice. They need a doctor to work chair side or doctors to work chair side, depending on how big your practice is. Who better to have than the person that's been there for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years to continue seeing your patients and preserve that goodwill. So you're going to be able to stay on and work in your practice as long as you want to, but we typically limit that post-closing commitment to three to five years, just so, you know, if you want to leave early, if you want to exit the practice after you've fulfilled your post-closing commitment, you have the option to do so, not the obligation. We talked about the fact that DSOs and private equity are now allowing doctors to invest alongside them and participate in future recapitalization events. So there's some incredible wealth creation opportunities via rolling or retaining equity and liquidating that equity at recap for two, three, four times your investment. In some cases, even more. The last reason this is not a good reason to sell to a DSO is FOMO. You know, I feel like I get at least a call a week from a practice owner who doesn't really isn't really compelled to sell to a DSO, but they they're they're hearing about what's happening in the marketplace, and they're like, "Hey, I don't I don't want to miss the window, right? I want to set this is a game of musical chairs, and I don't want to be the last one standing." FOMO is not really a good reason to consider selling your practice. You've got to have a compelling reason, and, and typically. It's a combination of economics, you know, monetizing your equity in your business at a favorable valuation while valuations are at an all time high and then infrastructure and support, you know, alleviating some of that managerial burden, getting access to the business function of a DSO and private equity and then leveraging the economies of scale that they bring to the table. So let's talk a little bit about what DSOs are looking for. You know, what types of practices are they acquiring? Uh, right now, they're acquiring all types of practices, general dentistry and all dental specialties. I would say with oral surgery and ortho probably being the hottest verticals in the dental space at the moment from a DSO demand perspective, you know, oral surgery practices are trading, you know, for seven to 10 times EBITDA, um, ortho practices you know, trading anywhere from, you know, six to eight, nine times EBITDA. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about EBITDA multiples and, and how those are determined in a minute. But ortho and OMS, definitely hot at the moment. Uh, we've got over 150 DSOs buying general dentistry practices. But we've also seen massive consolidation with endo and perio. Uh, we've seen several DSOs focus on the all on four implant practices, uh, that's been a unique wrinkle here recently. So all dental specialties and of course, general dentistry, you know, massive demand for practices in that realm. In an ideal world, DSOs would prefer that you're located within 60 miles of a major metro area. That doesn't mean if you're in a rural environment, your practice can't be sold to a DSO, but you're gonna see more demand if your practice is located within 60 miles of a major metro market. And predominantly why DSOs like that is from a density perspective. They like to build out significant density that's hard to do in a rural market and from a recruiting perspective. So recruiting associate doctors, recruiting staff is much easier in a major metro area than it's going to be in a tertiary market or a rural market. TTM revenue, what does TTM stand for? Trailing 12 months. So DSOs pay most 
the, the closest attention to your revenue over the 12 months leading up to a sale. They would prefer that revenue is 1.5 million or higher. Doesn't mean that if you're under that mark, you can't sell to a DSO. Uh, it just means that in order to generate any type of meaningful EBITDA, EBITDA of 250, 300,000 or more, you're going to have to be generating top line revenue of 1.2 to 1.5 million. So as a general rule, we don't represent practices with revenue under 1.5 million because it's hard to generate substantial demand as well as substantial return on your investment in our commission if you're operating under that threshold. Most CSOs are looking for practices of EBITDA of 300,000 plus. Again, that kind of, you know, that plays with revenue. So a healthy EBITDA margin is around 20%. So if you're at 1.5 million in top line revenue, a 20% EBITDA margin would be 300,000 in EBITDA. Minimum of five operatories. If you're four operatories, you know, it's it would potentially work assuming your revenues at 1.5 million or higher. But most DSOs are looking for five plus operatories. Their goal at the end of the day is to convert every practice to a multi-provider practice, two or more doctors. You really need five or more operatories to make that happen. Selling doctors and or associate doctors available to continue working for three to five years post-sale. This is a hot topic with a lot of our doctors. It doesn't mean that you've got to work five years full-time chairside post-sale. Most DSOs honestly don't care who's doing the dentistry so long as there's a competent doctor to do it. So if you want to sell and continue working full-time for a year or two post-close and then back away from the chair, maybe cut back your work schedule from four days a week to two days a week at the two-year mark, as long as you've got an associate doctor there to backfill your productivity, that works. But controlling the narrative regarding your runway to an exit is critically important. If you want to maximize your valuation, five years is ideal. And again, that just means five years before you completely exit the business. You don't even have to work chair side at all if you don't want to, so long as you've got competent associate doctors there to backfill your production. So I alluded about DSO practice valuations, valuations from a private equity DSO perspective. So a healthy EBITDA margin for a privately owned practice is typically 20 to 25%. So we gave that example earlier. If you're doing 1.5 million in top line revenue, once you back out overhead, real overhead, minus all you know discretionary personal expenses, that's not real overhead. But once you take revenue minus real overhead, minus a market wage for the doctor, and in a general dentistry practice, that's gonna be around 30% of doctor collections in a specialty practice that might be 35%, let's say 32 to 35% of doctor collections. In an ortho practice, that's gonna be about $1,500 per day per doctor. Um, once you back out that market wage for the doctor, at the end of the day, that's EBITDA. So revenue minus real overhead, excluding personal discretionary and one-time expenses, minus the market wage for the doctor equals EBITDA. So in a 1.5 million top line practice at a 20% EBITDA margin, you're generating $300,000 in EBITDA. And then they apply a multiple to that EBITDA. So if the multiple is 5X, it's gonna be $1.5 million valuation. If it's 7X, uh, it's going to be a $2.1 million valuation on a practice with top line revenue of 1.5 and EBITDA of 300. So practices with EBITDA of less than a million typically sell in the range of six to eight times EBITDA. Now, pre-COVID, that was like four to six times EBITDA. So again, we've seen a pretty good jump in valuations post-COVID. Practices with EBITDA of a million plus typically sell in the range of seven to 10 times EBITDA. So I will say this, practices in the range of 500,000 in EBITDA to about 3 million in EBITDA, valuations are rock solid, as high as they've ever been. Practices with EBITDA of under 500,000, especially under 300,000, we've seen less demand recently since 
this regional banking crisis, rising interest rate environment started. And we've seen valuations and demand constrict on huge, huge platform investments with EBITDA of, let's say, 3 million plus, but really 5 million plus. You know, you start to limit your buyer pool significantly when you have EBITDA of north of 5 million. And we've seen valuations demand cool off in that environment a little bit over the past six months. But in that sweet spot, the middle market, 500,000 in EBITDA up to about 3 million in EBITDA, sky high demand, sky high valuation. So that's really good news considering that, you know, we're operating a little bit of a difficult environment. So what factors outside of the EBITDA level impact the EBITDA multiple? Number of doctors, you know, the more doctors, the better. They Key man risk is a big talking point in the DSO private equity world. So if you've got the doctor production bifurcated between multiple providers, that's a good thing because that drives down key man risk as opposed to, you know, a super producer practice where there's a single provider producing three, $4 million a year doing a lot of cosmetics, implants, all on fours. That practice has a lot more risk, key man risk, than a practice with the same level of revenue with a more restorative bread and butter procedural mix where you've got three doctors producing $4 million as opposed to a single super producer. Now, that doesn't mean that the super producer practice can't be sold. You just might not have as much demand and it might trade for a slightly lower multiple than that bread and butter multi-doctor practice. Number of locations. Um, all things equal. If you have more storefronts, you have more opportunity for growth. Therefore, you might see a little bit higher multiple. But understand that more locations come with more fixed overhead. So a $5 million practice with a single location is likely going to have far more EBITDA than a $5 million revenue practice with three locations. But all things equal, if the EBITDA was equal between those two opportunities and one had one location, one has three locations, the three location practice will likely trade for a slightly higher multiple. Geography matters. There are, I would say, say you know, we talked about metro areas versus rural and tertiary markets. You don't have as much demand in smaller markets as you do major metro areas. The DSO consolidation is happening throughout the country. Uh, but there are certain states where you don't see as much demand as you do in other areas of the country. Uh, Florida, Arizona, Texas, the Midwest, New England, sky high demand. And that's simply because you have a lot of DSOs that are based in those geographies that are building density, that already have density in those geographies. The West Coast, you know, California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Idaho, those markets are just starting to consolidate. So you don't have as many DSOs operating in those markets, but the wave is coming. So we're starting to see DSOs that were born in those markets uh, start to take on private equity capital and start to invest and grow and, and begin to acquire practices at a rapid clip. And then we've got other DSOs that have a footprint in other geographies outside the West Coast that are now eyeing the West Coast and beginning to acquire practices in those markets. So the DSO consolidation is happening across the country and is just starting to occur on the West Coast. Your level of infrastructure. If you've got really strong centralized infrastructure and EBITDA 2 million plus, you're going to be looked at as a platform as opposed to if you've got a bunch of locations, 10, 15, 20 locations with no centralized infrastructure, you're probably not going to trade for as high of a multiple as you would if you had strong scalable infrastructure whereby a private equity firm could buy you and immediately start to acquire practices at a rapid clip and utilize leverage your existing infrastructure to support those offices. Pair mix. Uh, there's definitely a pecking order. You know, PPO, fee-for-service, uh, DSOs are heavily interested in. You know, anytime you've got a significant amount of Medicaid or capitation, HMO in a practice, it could impact demand, marketability, and the multiple. Service mix. We talked a little bit about bread and butter dentistry versus 
you know, these all on four heavy implant practices. You're going to have more demand for the bread and butter practices than you will the implant all on four practices. But the good news is there's a lid for every pot at the moment. And there's actually really high demand from specific DSOs for those uh, implant focused all on four type practices, cosmetic offices at the moment. Um, but the more restorative the practice is, the more bread and butter, the more, the easier it is to duplicate that production, to plug and play new providers, typically the more demand you're going to see and, and the higher the multiple. Upside potential. Is your business maxed out? You know, did you hit a peak two years ago and now you're starting to come down the other side of the hill? You, you already hit maturity and the practice is dec in decline or is the practice in growth mode, Right. Are you at the peak or are you? is there more meat on the bone, right? Could the DSO come in and help you continue to grow the practice from a revenue and EBITDA perspective? I would say the higher the propensity for post-affiliation growth, typically the higher the demand and the higher the multiple. And what we're normally going to do is negotiate in that situation some type of growth-oriented earnout, whereby you're able to actually increase your valuation based upon post-closing growth in the first 12 to 24 months. Doctors post-closing plans, we talked about the fact that you really need to stick around for three to five years post-closing in order to maximize your valuation and your associates and your partner doctors sticking around is also going to matter. The DSO wants to know that we're not gonna have a max exodus of doctor talent, you know, soon after closing, because that's going to impact the viability of that practice from a revenue and EBITDA perspective long-term. And then the owner's personality. So a lot of people think that from a private equity DSO perspective, all they really care about is the numbers. But what I will tell you is your personality matters. What we typically tell our clients is be the most charismatic version of yourself and let us worry about the economics. If the DSOs fall in love with you, if they like you, if they want you as a partner, it moves the needle from a valuation perspective. It moves the needle from a multiple perspective. All right, so let's talk a little bit about DSO deal structures. You know, what are the different types of DSOs that are out there? How are they structuring their deals? And these are the, the most common deal structures that we see. Uh, so we'll go through those just at a high level. And, uh, and kind of talk about how those look. So 100% sale with a holdback. That's what we call kind of the traditional DSO model. You know, this was really the model that, that Heartland's always used. And, you know, Heartland was kind of the first girl at the dance. So uh, they, I'll give them credit for kind of inventing this model. And it's a relatively common model that private equity uses across multiple healthcare verticals. In this scenario, you're going to sell 100% of your practice. They're going to give you anywhere from 70 to 80% cash at close. And they're going to re they're going to pay you the remaining 20 to 30% of the value of the practice over time. So essentially you're going to have a hold back and they're going to pay you an annual installments whether that be over a 3 to 5 year period contingent upon two things typically. You fulfilling your post-closing work back, so staying on and continue to work for some period of time, and the practice maintaining either the revenue or EBITDA level or both over that period of time. So just for discussion purposes, let's say you sold your practice for a million dollars. They would give you seven hundred dollars to 800000 cash at close. Let's say you agreed to stay on for three years post-closing. They're going to pay you the remaining two to 300,000 broken up in annual installments over three years continued upon you staying on and fulfilling your post-closing work commitment and maintaining the revenue and or EBITDA of the practice until your earnout is paid. So that's kind of the traditional DSO model. Um, not a lot of upside there. You know, the practice valuation is determined at the time of sale. You don't really have the opportunity to participate in recapitalization events. So it is very, very rare that we use that model with our clients. So it's very rare that our clients would choose to sell to a DSO under this first DSO deal structure. So let's talk about the next one. 
100% sale with a holding company investment. So we call this the holding company model. This is a very, very common private equity model. It's very commonly used in the DSO space. So in this scenario, you sell 100% of your practice. So you don't retain any ownership in your existing business. And then you buy stock in the holding company of the DSO. So you are essentially invested in the broader level DSO. In this scenario, the goal is to make an investment in that stock and liquidate that stock in full or in part. In the holding company model, you'll likely have the opportunity to liquidate the holding company stock in full at recap at a handsome return. So most DSOs will tell you that their goal is to generate anywhere between a three to 5x return on that holding company stock. In this model, you've got to think about when you're entering the recap cycle, okay? So the later you enter the recap cycle, the more muted the return on the stock. The earlier you enter the recap cycle, typically the higher the return. And the reason being is following recap, the DSO is going to set the value of the stock at what they call, call par value. Typically, that's a dollar a share. And then they're going to mark that stock up in value as they get closer to reaching the next recapitalization event. So if you enter the recap cycle immediately following a recap event, you can expect to pay somewhere around par value, a dollar, dollar fifty, maybe two dollars a share. If you enter the recap cycle later in the process and your hold time to the next liquidity event is lesser than your colleague that maybe sold two or three years ago, you might be buying the stock for three, four, five dollars a share. So your return is going to be muted compared to the person that has been holding that stock for a significantly longer period of time. Time value of money, the longer you have to a liquidity event, the higher your return should be. The shorter your hold time, the more muted your return is going to look. So you need to think about when you're entering the recap cycle. What are you paying for that stock? When's the next recap going to occur? What's the projected return from today, from the time that you sell your practice to recap? So let's move on to the joint venture model. So this is a really common model being used across multiple DSOs at the moment. And uh, I would say that MB2 is probably the, you know, the 800 pound gorilla, kind of the first to market using the joint venture model. In this scenario, you're going to sell 60 to 70% of your practice to the DSO for cash at close. And then you are going to retain a 30 to 40% equity interest within your own four walls, within your own practice. So rather than owning stock at the parent company level, you're actually going to own the stock at the practice level. And in doing so, the benefit is you're going to share in the ongoing pro rata EBITDA of the business post affiliation. So if you own, let's say you do a 60 40 joint venture deal, you sell 60%, you take 60% cash at close, you retain 40% interest in your business you're going to receive 40% of the ongoing EBITDA of the business after the management fee charged by the DSO yeah. ongoing post affiliation. So in this scenario, EBITDA distributable EBITDA is going to look like this revenue minus the true overhead of the business minor doc minus doctor compensation minus the DSO's management fee, which could range from anywhere from five to 8% of the revenue of the practice, what's left over is EBITDA. If you own 40% of the business post affiliation, you're typically going to receive 40% of that EBITDA. You need to be aware that there's some joint venture buyers out there that are going to encumber the practice with debt, which is going to be an additional overhead expense that's going to dilute your EBITDA distributions. And there's some joint venture buyers out there that don't allow for EBITDA distributions despite the fact that you're holding equity at the practice level. So you just need to be aware of what you're getting into because not every joint venture deal is the same. Same goes for the holding company model. 
you need to be aware of, you know, how much equity can you liquidate at close? And is there a ceiling on the, the return? In other words, if the DSO trades for, you know, 13x or 15x, is there a ceiling, right? Where whereby you only get to monetize your equity at 10x. We've seen that. So you need to be aware that there's a lot of nuances in these deal structures and in these deal terms as you begin to get LOIs that you need to pay very, very close attention to. Because even if a DSO, even if you have three DSOs that all prescribe to the same deal structure, the fine, the fine details will impact your ultimate return at the end of the day. So we've talked a little bit about the traditional DSO deal structure, the 100%, 100 sale and holdback. We've talked about the holding company model. We talked about the joint venture model. So let's talk about the hybrid model. The hybrid model is where your equity component is bifurcated into joint venture equity and holding company equity. So in, in this scenario, let's say you're going to do a 70-30 deal. You're going to receive 70% cash at close, and the remaining 30% is going to be bifurcated into 15% joint venture equity, equity within your own four walls, and 15% holding company equity, uh, equity within the parent company of the DSO. You're going to have the opportunity to liquidate that holding company equity at recap, hopefully at a handsome return, and then that joint venture equity is going to re be retained at the practice level and likely have to be sold to another doctor at the point that you want to exit that equity. So the hybrid model is essentially just a combination of the holding company model and the joint venture model. Now let's talk about the roll-up concept. So this to me is not a legitimate DSO deal structure. There's a lot of people out there trying to sell doctors on the concept of loosely affiliating 10, 20, 30 practices, having them act like they're one company and all go to market simultaneously and sell to a single buyer at what they're promising is going to be a significantly higher EBITDA multiple than those practices are worth individually. And in my opinion, that's complete nonsense. Nobody has really pulled this off on a broad scale. The dumb money left the market when interest rates skyrocketed and when the regional banking crisis started. So in this environment, the roll-up concept is not really palatable to private equity. Private equity is slick. Private equity are very, very smart investors. They see through the thin veil of illusion of trying to act like a bunch of unaffiliated, unintegrated offices are actually a fully integrated, scalable platform. And therefore, they're not going to pay a premium multiple for that concept. So there are people out there today that are saying, hey, join my co-op. You're going to pay $20,000, $30,000 to join the co-op. We're all going to get on the same practice management software. We're all going to use the same accounting firm. And Doc, while your practice might be worth six or seven times EBITDA on your own, we're all simultaneously going to sell to the same buyer for 10 to 12 times EBITDA. Oh, and by the way, along the way, you're going to pay me administrative fees. You're going to pay me, uh, let's say, $2,000 a month, $5,000 a month. And then when we sell, when we monetize the roll-up and sell to a DSO or private equity firm, you're going to pay me a handsome brokerage fee. You're going to pay me 10, 15, 20% transaction fee. The reality is you've got to move the needle substantially substantially from a valuation perspective, you better get 10 or 12x because the fees that the proprietors of that roll-up concept are charging are massive and they're going to erode your return. I would also argue that they massively limit your optionality because if you all have to sell to the same buyer, you've got 20 practices in the group and all of you are at a different stage in your career. You all have slightly different offices. You're all trying to accomplish different things. You all have a different why as to why you chose to pursue a DSO affiliation. It's not a one size fits all approach. If you all have to sell to the same buyer with the same deal structure, your optionality is severely limited. So I encourage you, do not buy into the roll up concept. 
it is not going to produce a higher economic outcome and it's going to severely limit your optionality. The only person that wins in the roll-up concept, if, if you're able to pull it off, is the person that organized the co-op. So I'll get off my soapbox, but that's, that's my viewpoint on the roll-up concept. So let's spend just a few minutes debunking DSO myths. Uh, DSOs are evil. I will say that, you know, if I brought DSOs up to my clients six, seven years ago, most of them would have run me out of their offices. But the reality is because DSOs have learned how to stay in their lane. They've learned how to allow for complete clinical autonomy and a lot of operational autonomy and just support businesses, businesses from an administrative perspective. That old corporate dentistry DSOs are evil moniker has started to fade. Um, so I will say that this iteration of DSOs, uh, because they've learned to stay in their lane and because they've allowed doctors to invest alongside private equity and enjoy the arbitrage, the returns that private equity is generating through that joint venture or holding company equity component, it's become much, much more acceptable to look at going down the DSO path than it was, you know, six, seven, eight years ago. All DSOs are the same. I, I say this a lot. If you've met one DSO, you've met one DSO. They are all different. Uh, so they all have a different background, a different history, a different culture, a different deal structure, a different level of infrastructural support, a different level of operational and management pedigree. They all have a different investor. Uh, they're all at a different stage in their recap cycle. They all have different goals. So it's critical that if you're going to look to take your practice to market, that you create optionality, you get to know a lot of different buyers so that you can figure out what is what does the landscape look like, you know, and align the deal structure and the culture and infrastructure of the buyer with your why, with what you're looking to accomplish, with with how your practice functions. Because I would argue that economics valuation is is just as important as fit in deal structure. They're equal. A lot of people focus on their valuation and the EBITDA multiple, and they lose sight of what was their why, what are they trying to accomplish, and how deal structure and fit plays into that conversation. Deal structure and fit are equally or maybe even more important than the initial valuation. And who you partner with from an economic perspective matters. You know, we talked earlier about there's a lot of DSOs on hold right now that aren't growing, that don't have capital, that are struggling to reach a recapitalization event. You don't want to be one of those sellers that's partnered with that DSO. You want to be with a DSO that is positioned for long-term sustainability and success that's going to reach their financial goals because that second bite of the apple, that recapitalization event, depending on how much equity you retain or roll, could be worth as much or more than the initial liquidity event when you monetize the initial portion of your practice. So you need to be very cautious, careful, and pragmatic about how you approach the process of selling your practice and make sure that you create as much optionality as possible. Everyone's always focused on the EBITDA multiple. You know, I feel like people around the water cooler want to brag about, oh, I got six times EBITDA, I got seven times EBITDA, I got eight times EBITDA for my practice. You know what matters a lot more than the multiple? The EBITDA itself. EBITDA should be completely objective, but I will tell you it's very subjective. If you set your financials to three different CPAs and three different DSOs, you probably get back six different EBITDA figures. And it's incredible how often advisors, including CPAs, don't really know how to calculate EBITDA. So you need to make sure that you've got a sell side advisor. That's what we do. We only represent sellers that's acting on your behalf to provide you with an accurate EBIT analysis that's as high as possible, but defensible. So controlling the narrative regarding EBITDA is critical to maximizing your valuation. Every dollar in EBITDA is worth anywhere from six to $10 in value. So you wanna make sure that you control the narrative regarding EBITDA. If you respond, to an unsolicited offer, if you're talking to just one DSO, you're letting your buyer control the narrative regarding your EBITDA and regarding your valuation. 
DSOs play games with EBITDA. Their goal at the end of the day is to buy the practice for the lowest possible valuation. They're going to undershoot your EBITDA. They may even promise you an awesome multiple, but if they've undershot your EBITDA by 100, 200,000, it doesn't matter what the multiple is. There's an erosion in value through the fact that they controlled the narrative regarding your EBITDA and they gave you an artificially low EBITDA number to apply the multiple to. So control the narrative regarding EBITDA is a huge part of what we do and it's critical to maximizing valuation. We kind of talked about this earlier. More locations equals a higher EBITDA multiple, a higher valuation. Not necessarily. More locations comes along with higher fixed overhead. So I'd much rather have a single location practice with $5 million in top line revenue and a million dollars in EBITDA than a five location practice with $5 million in top line revenue and $600,000 in EBITDA. EBITDA is really what drives value, not locations. So more locations does not equate necessarily to a higher valuation. There's also a misnomer that private equity buyers pay more for, for practices than DSO strategic buyers. So DSOs are often referred to as strategic buyers. That's not necessarily the case. So private equity will pay typically a higher multiple than DSOs will pay for a platform investment, a multi-location practice with 2 million or more in EBITDA. But private equity offer often will layer on infrastructural cost on top of your EBITDA, or you may already have centralized infrastructure that is burdening your EBITDA. So private equity is going to pay you typically a higher multiple on a lower EBITDA figure because they have to factor in centralized infrastructure because their goal is to immediately begin to scale that platform to scale the business they acquire, and they're going to need infrastructure to do so. Whereas a DSO, a strategic buyer, already has the infrastructure built. So they already have those costs sitting on their P&L. So they're not going to have to burden your business with infrastructure because they've already built it. And if you already have centralized infrastructure, they may strip out some or all of that infrastructure and give you credit for an add back for those costs to increase your EBITDA. So they're likely going to pay a lower multiple, but they're going to pay that multiple on a higher EBITDA figure. So what we normally see is from a private equity perspective and a DSO perspective, the valuations are often congruent, even though the EBITDA multiples are different because they're bidding based on a different EBITDA figure. So I know that's a mouthful, but just know that the ultimate valuation from a private equity buyer versus a DSO buyer may not be significantly different because they're working from a different EBITDA figure. This last one I'll end with on debunking the DSO miss. A lot of people think, hey, you're a broker. Your job is to find a buyer. I already have a buyer. Therefore, I don't need a broker. That could not be further from the truth. Finding a buyer is a very small part of what we do. There's DSOs out there everywhere. They're calling. If you've got a successful practice, I have no doubt that you're being inundated with solicitations from DSOs on a daily basis. But we've already talked about the fact that not all DSOs are the same. And you need to create optionality. You need to understand what your options are. You need to understand the landscape. You need to talk to and meet a lot of different buyers in order to find the right fit and the right deal structure. But also you've got to leverage competition to maximize valuation. If DSOs know that they're the only ones at the table, they're gonna manipulate the conversation regarding EBITDA and they're gonna underbid your practice. You are gonna leave significant value on the table hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, if you're talking about a larger practice on the table, if you don't have a good sell side advisor and you don't create optionality and competition for your practice. It is incredible the results that we accomplish through putting these DSOs, putting private equity buyers in a competitive environment. And we typically utilize a bid process in order to do so. And we're gonna talk a little bit about our process and some case studies here in a little bit and show you exactly what we were able to accomplish for our clients, many of which, I would say the vast majority of our clients 
already talking to a DSO or two, already have an offer from a DSO at the time that they engage our services. And we step into the room, we say, hey, time out. Let's take a step back. Let's do evaluation. Let's reset the table. Let's reset expectations. Let's control the narrative regarding EBITDA. Let's let everybody know that they're in a competitive environment. Let's hold their feet to the fire. Let's field multiple offers, five, seven, 10 offers, leverage that competition to find the right fit and maximize the economic outcome. All right, we're going to move into top five mistakes that it's making a DSO transaction. Um, number one, and I just went through this, responding to an unsolicited offer, failing to create a competitive environment. DSOs don't want you to have representation. They are actively going to encourage you not to engage your advisors and certainly not to engage a sell side advisor. They want to have a proprietary lead. They hope that a direct mailer that they sent you solicits a call or they have a colleague of yours that they partnered with that they're going to pay to introduce you to the DSO if and when a transaction closes. They want to do a deal in the dark. They don't want to have somebody like us at the table. They don't want to have other DSOs at the table. They want to control the narrative regarding EBITDA. They want to undershoot your EBITDA and, and, and essentially undershoot your value. You've got to create optionality to find the right fit and the right deal structure. You've got to create leverage through competition to negotiate the most favorable valuation in deal terms. The number one mistake that we make is that successful practice owners, for some reason, don't think they need representation. They think they can do a deal on their own. They behave as if DSO buyers are altruistic. Their buddy sold to a particular DSO. Therefore, they're going to sell to that same DSO without shopping around. That is a monumental mistake. Do not fall for that trap. Selling to the wrong DSO. We have heard horror stories. This doesn't happen with our clients because of how pragmatic we are and how careful we are about how we approach the process that realize post-affiliation that one, they left money on the table and two, maybe they sold to the wrong DSO. Maybe this deal structure wasn't the right fit. Maybe the DSO didn't have robust infrastructure and wasn't able to support them the way they wanted to be supported post-affiliation. You know, if they sold because they wanted better work-life balance and they wanted administrative help, but the DSO doesn't have the operational pedigree or the infrastructure, infrastructure to support them, that's a massive problem. So you've got to identify your why, right? Why are you looking to sell? Are, is it solely economic? Is it a combination of economics? And administrative support. And then you've got to go find the right DSO to solve for that why. They're all different. And not all of them are going to be positioned to solve for your why. And that's why you've got to create optionality. That's why you've got to look around. You've got to date around and figure out, you know, who's best positioned to solve for that why. Honestly, you got to figure out in the first place, does it even make sense to pursue a DSO affiliation? And that's why we always start with doing evaluation, getting to know our clients intimately. Uh, why are you looking to sell your practice? Let's define that. Let's put together a succinct narrative surrounding that. Let's quantify the economics and make sure that it makes sense for you to go to market and sell to a DSO. Is now the right time? Is it appropriate to wait a year or two? Um, you've got you've to explore, are you financially ready? Are you emotionally ready? And is your practice a good fit for a DSO transaction. We talked about this earlier, that fit and deal structure are as important as the valuation and the economic outcome. Not asking the right questions. You need to do a tremendous amount of due diligence on potential buyers. So we spend an inordinate amount of time vetting buyers, right? Making sure that we're only working with legitimate DSOs that have money, that follow through with their promises, both economically and from an operational and infrastructural perspective. We give our clients a list of around 30 questions that we want them to ask each DSO that we introduce them to during the marketing process. You know, on average, we introduce our clients to seven to 10 DSO buyers. Those are the seven to 10 of the top buyers out of the broader DSO buyer database that we manage that are best positioned that we feel to be aggressive in bidding on that opportunity and 
fulfilling our, our clients' why. So you even though we've done a tremendous job of vetting these buyers before we even let them sit at the table with our clients, we want you to ask them the questions, right? You know, what are you going to change about my practice? Are you going to expand my hours? Are you going to keep my staff? What, what do the benefits look like? You know, who is your private equity partner? When was your last recapitalization event? When do you expect your next recapitalization event to occur? You know, what is your projected return at recap? Has the private equity firm you're partnered with been successful in reaching recapitalization events in the dental industry with other investor, with other investments, with other DSOs, or at least in other healthcare verticals? The questions go on and on and on. But the reality is you've never done this before and you don't know the right questions to ask. So that's why we provide our clients with a detailed list of questions to ask each DSO buyer. Diligence should be a two-way street. Just as much as DSOs are doing diligence on your practice, you need to be doing diligence on them. So it works both ways. They're going to ask for an insane amount of information on your business. You have the right to ask a lot of questions of them as well. Not only do you want to ask the questions directly to the DSO and their management team, but you also want to speak with some of the doctors that have partnered with those DSOs in the past. You know, talk to somebody that's been with that particular DSO for two years, three years. Talk to somebody that recently joined that DSO to get a feel for, hey, tell me, you know, what did you like and not like? What did they change about your practice? Have they really been in a position to support you on a day to day? Um, if you hit a recapitalization event, was the economic outcome close to what they promised when you initially sold? You've got to make sure that you take a really, really careful and pragmatic approach to pursuing a DSO affiliation. Most of you will only have the opportunity to sell your business once. And this is the most impactful financial decision that you'll ever make in your professional lives and for a lot of you in your personal lives. Failure to obtain proper representation. You need to make sure you build a strong team. That, str that starts with a sell-side advisor. You need to have a dental attorney that's well-versed in DSO transactions. And you want to involve your CPA to quantify the tax implications. Um, so you want to make sure that you've got a strong team of advisors and you're consulting all of those advisors before you ever, in ever enter into conversations with DSOs. Look, I, I would prefer to be there before you ever start talking with a DSO. All too often, I get involved midstream, and, and that's fine. We're used to stepping in to the conversation midstream. You know, once you already have an offer, or you're already talking to a handful of DSOs. But just understand, I can't walk back anything that you said. And controlling the narrative regarding why you're looking to sell, what you're trying to accomplish, what your runway looks like post-affiliation, and controlling the narrative regarding EBITDA, critically important. It all matters in helping find the right fit and maximizing the outcome. And then falling for a gimmick. So earlier I got on my soapbox and talked a little bit about the roll-up concept and you know why I think it's BS, why I think it doesn't work, why I think it's a gimmick and it doesn't make sense for most practice owners. Um, so I encourage you, if you're part of a roll-up concept, give me a call. You need to look at your agreement. You need to understand the different levers that it has in it. You know, and one of those is tail coverage. So we've been talking to a lot of doctors that are currently involved in one of these roll-up concepts. They've been involved with it for a year, two years. They've been paying a bunch of fees along the way and nothing's come to fruition. And honestly, nothing ever will. It's death by a thousand cuts. You know, the people that have started these roll-ups are bleeding the doctors dry with administrative fees along the way, knowing that it doesn't really ever matter if they reach a liquidity event because they've made plenty of money just selling the gimmick and having the doctors continue to hope for a unicorn to walk in the door um, and, and hit a liquidity event. So you need to pay attention to tail coverage. Most of these agreements are structured in a way that you can exit the relationship at any time, but if you sell to any DSO or private equity firm that that co-op 
has discussed your practice with during the term of the agreement, they are due a commission should you sell to one of those companies within the next 12 to 24 months. So understanding what type of levers your agreements have in them are critically important. And honestly, just not falling for one of these roll-up concepts to begin with uh, is ideal. Another one I'll touch on is buy-side advisors. All right. So there are a lot of advisors out there that are calling large practice owners claiming that they will represent you for free. They'll help you sell your practice to a DSO at no cost. Well, the reason that they're not charging a fee is that the DSO is paying them a fee to bring them proprietary deals, meaning that the DSO has offered to pay this advisor a fee if they will bring them a seller that's not talking to any other DSOs. So buy-side advisors pretend to represent the practice owner when in reality they represent the DSO. Whoever is paying your fee is who you represent. Buy-side advisors are your enemy, not your friend. So just because you think you're going to save a commission, you decide to work with a buy-side advisor, just understanding they don't have your best interest in mind. You're going to leave significant optionality and value on the table if you work with a buy-side advisor. So I discourage you, stay away from these roll-up concepts, stay away from buy-side advisors. They are not there to benefit you. So let's talk a little bit about McLaren and Associates and our proven DSO affiliation process. So up to date, we've closed over 150 DSO transactions nationwide. All we do day in, day out, is represent large practice owners who are considering selling to a DSO, affiliating with the DSO, or bringing on a private equity partner. So I'll walk you through our process, and then I'm going to go through a few real-world case studies to show you what we've accomplished for our clients. So we always start with a discovery call. Let's schedule a call. Let's get to know each other. We can answer any questions that you have uh, about this webinar, the DSO space at large, I'm going to want to get to know a little bit about your why, right? Why are you looking to go down the DSO path or, or private equity partnership route? Um, learn a little bit about your practice. You know, how many doctors, where is it located, size of facility, revenue level? Um, what's your runway to retirement or, you know, exiting your business? Um, so discovery call, we get to know each other. And then from there, if it sounds like it makes sense for you to explore a DSO affiliation further, I'm going to encourage you to do an IBIT analysis and evaluation. Now, I would employ you do evaluation whether you want to sell tomorrow or sell three years, five years from now. Uh, the valuation cost is $2,500. That's our only upfront fee. And that's where we really do a deep dive. That's where we really get to know each other. We get to build trust, build a relationship, and then get to know your practice intimately from a financial perspective and really quantify from an economic perspective, what is a DSO affiliation going to look like? We have a pretty sophisticated valuation model that is used to determine EBITDA and the appropriate EBITDA multiple and arrive at what we think your practice would trade for in the open market. And then we also have a cash flow model where we can plug your numbers in to a no sale scenario and compare that to a joint venture scenario, a holding company model scenario, and a hybrid model scenario to kind of map out, you know, how does the no sale scenario, the hold scenario, uh, compare to different deal structures that are available in the DSO marketplace, assuming a certain valuation, as well as a few other economic assumptions regarding how recapitalization events are going to play out. So once we get through the valuation process, once we run through that cash flow illustration, you know, we'll talk about the options available and then you make a decision. You know, is it the right time? Is the DSO affiliation right for you and your practice? Is it the right time? And you won't feel any pressure from us to go to market. If it's the right time, great. We'll execute at a very high level. If it's not the right time, we can coach you on some changes you can make to your practice to make it more marketable and more valuable when it's time to go to market. Or if you have a particular financial goal, we can talk about, you know, mapping 
where you need to get to in order to accomplish that goal. So the valuation process is hugely productive, regardless if you're looking to go to practice now or two, three, five years from now. So I encourage anyone that watches this webinar to engage us for evaluate to at least schedule a discovery call, and then likely to engage us for evaluation so that you can quantify economically what does this look like for, for you and your practice. So once we've reviewed the valuation, discussed your options, assuming that you've made the decision to go to market, we're going to take the, mar the practice to market in a bid process. So the valuation is a private conversation between you and us. We're your sell side advisor. We're your ad advocate. We solely represent your interest. So when we take the practice to market, we're going to utilize a bid process. We found that that is the ideal way to ensure that we don't leave a dollar of value on the table. We're in a rapidly evolving marketplace at the moment. There's a lot of private equity still entering the marketplace. There's a lot of DSOs that are being aggressive. There's some DSOs that are being conservative. There's some that are on the sidelines. Economic conditions, interest rates, availability of bank funding, all those things are changing rapidly. So utilizing a bid process allows us to take advantage of the fact that there's going to be some buyers that are hyper aggressive and there's going to be other buyers that are conservative. We want to make sure that we don't price the practice and essentially undershoot ourselves because there may have been a buyer or two out there that falls in love with you. The practice is a perfect fit for their organization and would have bid a much higher valuation compared to how we price the practice. So the valuation is designed to set an economic expectation between you and us. And the goal is to take the practice to market in a bid process and either to meet the economic expectation that we set during the valuation process, or hopefully through creating a hyper competitive environment, substantially exceed it. And when we go through the case studies, you'll see that in the vast majority of cases, we far, far exceed the valuation that we put on the practice during that portion of the process. So when we take the practice to market in the bid process, we create a highly competitive environment among numerous DSO buyers. You know, there might be 50 DSOs that would be interested in your practice. We take the top seven to 10 DSOs out of those 50 and give them the opportunity to bid on the office, to meet you, get to know you, you get to know them and then submit an offer. We help you interview and vet potential buyers. So we're going to be at all meetings and on those initial Zoom calls. We're going to give you a list of questions to ask and discussion topics to be prepared to talk about during those initial meetings. We're going to obtain and compare multiple offers. So once we have all offers in the door, we can run them through that cash flow model that compares offer to offer economically. How do they play out on a five-year window? based upon the valuation that they've offered, based upon where they're at in the recap cycle, when the next recap is expected to occur, and what the financial implications are expected to be at recap, to quantify economically how do all the offers compare. You know, aside from economics, though, what we often do when we have all the offers come in the door is say, hey, obviously economics matter. They matter to all our clients. But economics aside, who are like the top one or two buyers that you felt the most comfortable with? Which deal structure do you like the most? And then once we know that, we can turn our attention to the economics and leverage that economic environment to get the most favorable economic outcome from the buyer that you like the best. The goal is to align fit and economics with the same buyer. So if we can maximize the economic outcome and have you partner with the, with the DSO buyer that you feel the best about, that's a win-win. That's that's the ultimate, you know, goal here. So we're going to determine which DSO is the right fit and negotiate the most favorable deal terms with that particular buyer. And we quarterback the process from start to finish. You need a good CPA. You need a good attorney. We can make those referrals. We're going to be there at the beginning to help educate and empower you to make a good decision, whether or not it makes sense to pursue a DSO affiliation, and then if and when you go to market. When it's time to go to market, we're going to ensure that we create as much optionality as possible, put the practice out to market in the bid process, 
to ensure that we maximize the economics and find the right fit. So at the end of the day, once you know you reach the day that you're going to close on your DSO affiliation, we want to make sure that you know why you chose to go down the DSO path to begin with, that you understood the landscape, you created optionality, you met a lot of different buyers, and that you maximized your economics and sold to the buyer that's the right fit for your particular situation and practice. So let's hop into a few case studies. Uh, I, I love this first one. So this was a general dentistry practice located in a major metro area in Georgia. Our client was 58 years old. He was selling to obtain administrative support and for exit planning purposes. He has about five years to retirement. This particular practice had 3.6 million in top line revenue, EBITDA of 1.3 million. So very healthy EBITDA margin, about a you know 33% EBITDA margin. He already had an offer in hand from a DSO for $6.8 million. He was actually a little reluctant about engaging us because he really liked the DSO that he had an offer from. His colleague had sold to that particular DSO. He thought it was a pretty good offer. I mean, $6.8 million on $3.6 million in revenue. Sounds like a pretty good offer, right? That's almost two times revenue. We ran his, he did engage us for the valuation. We did our EBIT analysis and we determined that we thought the value of the practice was about 8.5 million. That if we took the practice to market in a competitive bid process, we would fetch a value of about 8.5 million. So significantly higher than the valuation that he had in hand. We received five offers. Now in this particular practice, I could have gotten 20 offers. He already liked the DSO that was at the table. He wanted to run a very limited process. So we put the practice out to bid to seven buyers in this case, got five offers. Ultimately, he signed a letter of intent at $9.6 million. So $9.6 million offer on revenue of $3.6 million comparative to the offer he already had in hand of $6.8 million. We also negotiated a significant growth-related earnout. So if the practice grows post-close, the valuation will actually increase. It will be a secondary payout in year one and year two post-affiliation. He went with a 75-25 holding company structure, 75% cash at close, and he rolled 25% of the value of his practice into stock and the holding company of the DSO. This particular DSO is backed by a private equity firm that has been extremely successful in the dental market. They have already built and recapitalized three different DSOs. They currently own three other DSOs. So their pedigree is outstanding. So who did this practice sell to? That's the question, right? The client already had an offer of 6.8 million from a DSO he really liked in hand at the time that he engaged us. You would think that at a valuation of 9.6 million, this practice sold to one of the other four buyers that we brought to the table. It didn't. This practice sold to the same buyer that had made the $6.8 million offer for 9.6 million. Absolutely nothing changed other than the fact that the doctor hired us and we created a competitive environment. So he realized an increase in his practice value of almost $3 million, almost 50%, simply by hiring a sell-side advisor and running a formal process. So really, really proud of this result. Obviously, the client was thrilled, uh, reluctant to engage us, and ended up with uh, about a $3 million gain from uh, leveraging our services. So case study number two. This is a general practice located in Florida. Doctor's 40 years old, have a, has a young family. So young doc, you know, has owned this practice for uh, about 10 years and done very, very well. Rapidly growing office in a major metro area. Revenue of 4.3 million, EBITDA of 1.2 million. We did our EBITDA analysis, our valuation. We assigned a value of 7.9 million to it. We received nine offers. Ultimately, the practice traded for $10 million, an 8.6 EBITDA multiple on 1.2 million in EBITDA, plus 
And this is a high growth practice that's about to double the size of their facility, plus a $4 million growth related earn out. Meaning that if the practice grows substantially post close, our client could capture an additional $4 million in valuation post close. So all in a $14 million valuation, assuming the practice hits potential uh, growth targets, that's over a 10 X multiple on a practice with EBITDA of 1.2 million. He did a 70, 30 joint venture structure, meaning that he took 70% cash at close and 30% equity retained at the practice level. So he'll have the opportunity to liquidate a portion of that joint venture equity within a couple of years at an exponentially higher valuation. By nature of him joining a larger organization, you know, his equity is going to, to essentially double in value overnight. So not only did we accomplish a fantastic result at the initial transaction, but now he's got a wealth creation opportunity through the growth related earnout and participating in a future recapitalization event in a couple of years. The last case study I'm going to talk about just to display what's going on in the specialty marketplace. This is an OMS practice located in a major metro area in Illinois. Our client's 52 years old. He was selling predominantly for economic reasons, but it is a multiple location practice. He wants some help from an administrative operational support perspective. So it's a multi-location, -lo multi multi-doctor practice, revenue of 7.5 million, EBITDA of 2.3 million. We did our valuation at $18 million. We received seven offers. He signed an LOI at $23 million, three times revenue, 10 times EBITDA with an 80-20 holding company structure. So he's going to receive 80% cash at close. And then he invested 20% of the value in his practice in the holding company stock of the DSO that's expected to generate anywhere from a three to four times return over the next three to four years. So massive massive liquidity event at the time of close with this practice and then a secondary liquidity event that could have substantial economic implications in another three to four years so another fantastic result and these are not outliers these are the types of results that we're generating for our clients on a daily basis so really proud of the value that we're driving for clients do we earn a significant commission absolutely we do but it's well worth it as you can see most of our clients are generating a multi-million dollar return compared to what they would sell their practice for on their own. So at the end of the day, our goal is to at least double or triple our commission in enhanced valuation, as well as obviously enhanced optionality and fit for the client. So if, if we can move the valuation on average by 20 to 25% comparative to what you would receive by doing a deal in the dark and selling to a DSO on your own, it's a no-brainer, right? To, to hire a sell-side advisor, make sure that you're protected, make sure that you understand your options, make sure that you maximize your outcome. I appreciate you joining me today. Uh, I highly encourage you to give me a call, schedule a discovery call. You can call, text me shoot me an email. I hope that we have the opportunity to talk soon and we have the opportunity, if it makes sense, to take your practice to market and create a fantastic outcome for you. Take care. Bye-bye.